connecting to the ah okay there we are so sorry now we're recording I, my mistake is you can see I'm not the best with technology um, so we're doing the third webinar on turning people into customers which is sales and marketing in the generate webinar series now um, one of the things that you'll notice um, uh, this title here is um, sales and marketing sometimes people have marketing as as the sort of the title of, of this section of the business plan and it's important to really talk about sales and marketing you're going to see why and you're going to see why of all the sections of the business plan believe it or not this section gives me the biggest pain when I'm when I'm dealing with entrepreneurs and in a minute I'm going to take you through the process and tell you why now let's give some overview in context of where we're going with this so for those of you that are joining me please put yourself on mute um, just so that we can uh, uh, not hear um, but take a look at the outline here and you'll see that in the context of the business plan outline sales and marketing is after market research so what is important to realize here is this that um, when you look at the sales and marketing it's very difficult to do sales and marketing without doing proper market research so always remember that in that context if you are doing sales and marketing that piece of the puzzle the market research is fundamental to giving you the answers to this next section we're going to talk about so just keep that in the back of your mind the other thing you'll notice is that deeper we go into your business plan everything starts to interconnect this is where I, I think the uh, something that you need to start to realize there's a shift in uh, the business plan and in the sense that everything now starts to be turned over to metrics and numbers and let's face it most entrepreneurs when they start they don't like to deal with numbers and metrics and you'll see next time and when we do the webinar on in finance and offer um, the cash flow um, it, we're going to even a deeper dive into numbers it's one of those things that you as an entrepreneur have to get yourself you have to overcome that in other words you have to say this is part of parcel of being an entrepreneur now when we are talking about marketing oops this marketing here uh, oh I see yeah it, it doesn't allow me to uh, this is what I realized in this PowerPoint it doesn't allow me to to do it one at a time so I've given you the answer but I'll, I'll, I'll do that anyway so if you take a look at um, the definition of marketing the definition of marketing is anything that influenced the buying decision of a customer and I and I want to stay just for a minute I want you to just think about that too much too many times uh, people who are talking about marketing think in terms of marketing campaigns they all think that marketing is about doing a marketing campaign um, when in fact for so many entrepreneurs and what I call micro entrepreneurs you when you're starting out when you don't have that much money in your bank account you want to get going you probably have more power and more influence than you think because when you think about it how you come across how you talk to people that's marketing marketing is not just your Facebook page or your website um, or, or a Twitter account it starts before that it starts with how you respond on the phone it starts with what you have in your email signature so really especially today um, marketing has greater power if we understand when it where it starts and typically when we look at marketing there are two elements to marketing two parts one is the message and the other part is the medium so let me tell you what I mean by the message the message is all the lovely things we like to do as entrepreneurs which is work on our logo work on our messaging working our taglines our website or design which is fine you'll see in a minute but too many entrepreneurs focus too much on that and they get carried away with this thing called branding I'm working on my brand but let's be very clear here what a brand is and what a brand is not a brand is a reputation so when you start just because you have a logo and a tagline does not mean you have a brand because you don't have a reputation as a matter of fact I would say that someone who has no tagline and no logo and no website and no design but has quite a bit of customers has a brand and you do not if you're just if you're just starting with a, with a logo and a tagline so you start to quickly realize that a brand is something you grow into 
and more than likely it's something you refine as you go. Don't get me wrong, you want to have a clear message and you don't want to have schlocky material. You don't want to have a lousy logo and a lousy tagline or a misconstrued tagline. But be mindful that you are not at this point building a brand, you're growing into a brand. The second piece you'll notice here is the medium. This is what kind of tools you use, what kind of, and I'm gonna go into this in a bit more detail um, in your marketing plan um, when we talk about medium. Uh, suffice it is for me to say that when we look at this, this piece of the messaging, right, is that you need to have one key message. Again, this is why that market research isn't so important. What's your key value proposition? And you need to be consistent with that. It has to be consistent along across all mediums. So if you say that you're, you're, you've got a quality product and you say it in your Facebook page, you need to say it on your website, you need to say when you talk to people, you can't be telling me you're selling on price in one medium, um, you're selling on quality in another medium, um, and then you're selling it on services in the third one. That's called mixed messaging. And that's gonna get you in a lot of trouble um, when starting your business. So as we move forward on this, you're going to see that what's crucial here is that you have to pick one key benefit, one key value proposition and be exceedingly good at it. And everything else can be sort of fine. This is important for those of you that are, 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 are listening to this webinar for the first time, please go back to the other um, two webinars because that'll clarify that. But let me take you to a step further. Part of marketing is sales. And sales is the buying process. Sales to me is a component of marketing, but it is the most fundamental piece of marketing. It's a call to action. It's this interpersonal uh, interaction. Even if you have an online business, that process of doing business online is an interaction. And as entrepreneurs, you need to stay focused much more on your sales than on your marketing. Because remember when you're starting out, as I mentioned to you before, you do not have a brand. You are developing a brand. Here is the benefit of um, focusing on sales as opposed to marketing. When you focus on sales, you quickly get feedback on your product and service because remember you have to fine tune your product and service. You may assume what you've created is great but until people buy, until people give you feedback, until people put money on the table, that's just sort of wishful thinking. The second thing that's really important is that you start judging people by their behavior, not why they say, you know, there's so many people that will tell you you have a great idea, great business. Wow, this is super. Yep, I love it. And then when time comes to buy, they go, oops, no, I'm not gonna buy that, sorry. So that's the second reason, because actions speak louder than words. And the third reason, What's so important about focusing on sales is that when you start your business, we'll talk about this in the next webinar, cash flow is king or queen. Without cash, without money, without making a sale, it's very difficult to move your business forward. So some of you obviously may have, you know, in the initial phases, you know, if you open a retail store, you may have to spend some time on renovations, which is fine, you know, the first month or two. But if I'm working on an app and it's gonna take me, I don't know, six months to 12 months to get this developed, you and I both know you're not gonna get any sales at the very earliest until this is off the ground. So what you want to think about, really important here, is that when we talk about sales, you wanna go deep and not wide. So what marketing does generally is go wide. They want to develop awareness. Right? I, want, I, want to, you know, I want to develop brand awareness. That's what, what I mean by going wide. The problem is that when you look at developing awareness, is that takes a lot of time, energy, and money, but you still haven't got enough feedback on how good your product is. Going deep means you have a narrow group of seriously interested customers as opposed to a vast potential amount of users. And so, you know, what I find, um, with so much of, of this is that too many people are going wide when they start and not going deep enough. Does that make sense? And I want to just open that just quickly um, uh, for, for people that are listening in. I just want you to check in and see if that makes sense. 
just say, yeah, you know, got it. Anyone? Just write in the chat box. Okay. Makes sense to me. Okay, so we got the concrete examples of deep please. How do we go to? Got it. Super. So I like I, I like the fact that you guys want to know the concreteness. I like that. Super. So I'm going to take you there in a minute. So great, great, great stuff, guys. So I just want you to hold off, and then I'm going to show you how to go deep. Super. Love it. Okay. So let's go into the second phase here. What are the second phases to think about? That when we talk about sales, all of us, let's face it, have a story about what it means to sell. And usually it works something like this. People who do a lot of selling are sleazy or some rendition of that or, or, or combination of, well, selling's kind of, I don't like doing it. It's kind of, I don't feel, I feel awkward and I don't, you know, I don't like being sold at. So what we need to come to terms with when we talk about sales, that part of your job, whether you like it or not, you need to be thinking of yourself more as a salesperson than an entrepreneur because really that's what you're doing when you're starting out, right? Now, you don't have to do something that you dislike. This is not about being dishonest, and this means a lot of selling with integrity. And more and more today, the consumer is transparent. They can see right through you if you are, you know, pulling the wool over their eyes or not telling the truth. You know, the days of being a cheesy salesman uh, or, you know, a car salesman, for example, is kind of the image that comes to mind, are gone. So... Um, and again, you know, just on the side note, if, if you really want to think about selling, there's a great book called um, To Sell as Human by Daniel Pink. It's a wonderful book. kind of gives you a different perspective of what selling is all about, just to give you a side note. So we're going to come back to this, and we're going to go deep in a minute. But before we do that, we're going to look at something else, which is pricing strategy. Now, part of the business plan is going to ask you to talk about your price, and you're going to list your price. My prices are X, Y, Z. And I'm going to ask you next in the business plan, so why are you charging those prices? And I want to know what your competitors are charging. So I get a chance to compare. Now, here's the thing. Remember this. When you charge your price, your customer doesn't care what you're – and a lot of people will tell me they're going to put X percentage of markup. You know, the industry, well, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to put 50% markup. Your customer doesn't care what your markup is. They could care less. No one asks you, excuse me, can you tell me how much it costs you to make that product? No one asks you that. So basing your price on a flat rate markup is kind of dumb if you think about it because the customer doesn't really care. So your prices really should be based on a couple of things. Alternatives to the customers, right? Which means that, you know, in relation to what's available out there, competitors, um, other things I could take, and what do you tell me your value is? If you tell me your high end, then you better be charging high-end prices. You can't tell me you're a high-end product and not charge high-end prices. That tells me you have an inconsistent message. Now, don't get me wrong. You can be slightly less than the competition, slightly less if you're starting out. But generally speaking, you need to be very, very careful. Pricing is a killer for a lot of businesses, if, especially if they undercut themselves. In other words, they're way below um, the competition because obviously they're selling on price, which is always a bad idea. For those of you that are listening to this the first time, I'll tell you right up front, if your main strategy is selling on price, I'm going to be challenging you and, and really doubting whether or not this is the best strategy. Of course, if you're, if, you're, if you're starting a dollar store, that's a different story, right? Because we don't care about quality then. But these prices have to reflect through the eyes of the customer, not through your eyes, not because it costs you X amount of dollars and therefore you're going to put X amount of percentage. Don't get me wrong, you need to know all of those costs. You need to know what your profit margins are. All of that is necessary. But then you have to turn it around and say, what is the price, price reflective of what the customer is willing to pay for? Right? Does that, is that clear for, for anyone? Does that make sense? You can just say yes, no. Okay, good. So, thank you. We're going to move on. And now we're going to go into the next layer which is, this is what you guys had asked me about, how do we go deep? And you're going to see how sales come into the play. Now, the problem with most marketing plans are these two problems here. So 90% of the marketing plans I get, these are the two uh, areas that I have to contend with. Either I get people just give me a shopping list of ideas, 
Or they say, I need the money, uh, Dominic, if you gave me this much money, I know what I'm going to use it for. And it's usually something like a big win, like a, give me for SEO optimization or, you, you know, like I want to spend on $15,000 on Google AdWords. So it's kind of like a, a quick fix, a quick ticket. Usually that is a bad idea. Actually, I take that back. That's a terrible idea. So let me show you concrete what that means. So for, imagine for a minute, I said to you, uh, you have a toolbox in front of you of all the marketing activities you can do for your business. I'm going to call these marketing activities, tactics later on. I prefer the word, but... And look, at I just listed some... Act there's lots, a lot more you can list. You can see, take a look. If you look at it, there's, I don't know, there must be at least 20, 25. I, I don't know, I didn't count. Um, and so what typically happens is people will give me shopping. And, and you know, obviously, one of the shopping lists is they'll tell me sh social media, and then they'll list like eight or 10 of these apps they, they're going to use for their business, right? And these are the things, great, lovely, isn't this super? Except there's a huge problem with that. That is so vague and unspecific that you might as well not even give me anything because that's like telling me the sun's going to shine up in the morning. Next morning I wake up, great. Social media, I hear social media is great. Very, very vague. What happens on the other extreme is I like I was saying to you before, people might just pick one and say, I'm going to put all my money in SEO optimization and that's it. Because I think if I do that, things will work and that's what I need the money for. Again, the problem with that is, is they haven't done enough in-depth research on what really works. And sometimes some of the answers are, are less. Um, see, here's the problem with marketing a lot of times is we think the answers are about sizzle. A great idea, like a viral video, and if you do something creative when you start. My response to that is, before you break the rules, you need to know what the rules are. And if you do market research properly, the, the, the answers will stare you right in the face. It's not going to be rocket science, I can tell you, when you start. Don't get me wrong, you can be creative as you go along, but when you start, it's, it's really important to understand your industry and your marketplace, and then you'll see how some of these activities relate. So let me go back. Sorry, actually, let me go forward to show you what the next step is. So two things that you need to think about in the medium. So in the medium, you have a marketing strategy. A marketing strategy is a sense of direction. So uh, which activities are you going to select your focus? So if we look back here, we've got plenty of activities you can do, right? I don't need a shopping list. I don't need you telling me what you're going to do here, all of these things, in a minute. Instead, I'm going to ask you to stay focused. And by its very definition, strategy means what you're not going to do. Aha. Uh -huh. In my experience is that as entrepreneurs, we get overloaded with so much information and so many apps that we, you know, someone always has a new app. Here, you should do WhatsApp now. You should do Snapchat. You should, you know, why? Because I think it's cool. I heard it's great. You as an entrepreneur need to stop getting over encumbered with a layer upon layer of things to do and instead make a choice and then zone in on those choices. Being an entrepreneur is more about making a choice and then staying focused on those choices. So let me give you some concrete example of what I mean by marketing strategy. So instead of choosing 20 activities or just choosing one, your job is to choose the top three. Three, not 20, not 10, not one, but three. And you're going to put them in order of priority. The first one will be your primary marketing activity. Your secondary will be, uh, second one will be secondary. And, and third will be your supporting one. In my experience, your top three marketing activities will produce 70 to 80% of your revenue. 70 to 80%. So don't get me wrong doesn't mean that you're not going to have more marketing activities as time goes on. And by the way, when I talk about marketing activities, every single app is a separate marketing activity. So you can't say social media is one of my marketing activities. That's nonsense. So which social media? Because as you know, the way you use Facebook is different than the way you use Twitter. Yes, you can use Hootsuite and all of these things to manage it, but boy, that looks awful when, when I'm, you know, doing Hootsuite and I see, oh boy, this is kind of automated. I see the Twitter and it's kind of an automated thing.
Dominic? Not sure if anybody else but me, if Scott can't hear Dominic right now. Oh, I can see. Okay, Sandy, Jets. Got another couple of people. Dominic, can you hear us now? Okay, we seem to temporarily lost Dominic's audio. No, Dominic, we cannot hear you. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Does we can you? now. Oh, okay. Woo. It's always scary. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. We're back. Yeah, technology is always funny. Okay, who knows? He just did so that to see if people were paying what? attention. Sorry? We just did that to see if people were paying attention and they were. Exactly. <laughs> so where was I? Oh, yes. Um, so you're going to see in a minute, uh, um, when I take you to the, the example here, uh, you'll get a better idea what I mean. So if we're talking about our example from um, uh, last week in, in market research, so how do we decide – you know, which marketing activities I do, and I'm only going to pick three, so which three do I choose? Well, what you need to do, figure out, first of all, who's your best customer? Because if, if you don't know who your best customer is, you can't do this exercise. It's exactly why so many entrepreneurs get in trouble. They don't know who their best customer is, or worse. They say anybody and everybody that wants to buy this product. Oops, there's a problem. And then, of course, um, you're going to be trying marketing activities till the cows come home, and you're going to be in a lot of trouble. The second thing you need to do is look at best practices. Remember what I said in market research. So you don't want to look at the Walmarts of the world, what they're doing, because that they've got money to blow in terms of marketing. You want to look at companies that have been around a couple of years who are similar to your field. What have they done? What's worked for them? And so it's a bit of digging. It's a bit of finding. What you're going to find useful is what are some of the obvious things to do? So let's take this a step further. Let's take our friend, uh, homemade raspberry jam, and I want to sell homemade raspberry jam out, and, you know, I've got something based out in Corner Brook, and I think this is fantastic. People love my raspberry jam. So, what are my three marketing activities? I do my best customer, and I say, you know what? I need to start selling uh, wholesale to retail. So, let's, let's look at my number one is to knock on doors, sell to Coleman's and Dalman stores. Right? So, I'm taking my jars... I'm taking my examples, I'm talking to the, the manager or the purchasing manager at these stores in Newfoundland and saying, this would be a fantastic fit to your store. This is homemade. Um, this is the cost to you. This is how much I'm suggesting you retail it for. Can I come back and see you? So you start seeing that in many cases, the answers will be obvious because if I want to sell the retail, then I don't have to come up with some crazy scheme about this. The next thing you'll notice here is um, that I need to do some in-store demo. So when someone walks in the store, they'll be um, able to say, what is this? And I'll say, here, taste this. Oh, and by the way, it's just on that shelf over there. So that's my second supporting uh, uh, secondary strategy. And then Instagram. Instagram, again, it's a social media, yes, but I, I'm very specific, right? I'm very, very specific in which social media I'm going to maximize. So here's the dilemma. When someone comes to me and they give me a shopping list of apps, I know for a fact they will be probably weak in most of them. They'll be strong in one of them. Your job is to pick the one that's the strongest and focus your energies on that. And I hate to tell you this, but a blogging and casting, podcasting in the early stages is a bad idea because it's going to take a while to get up there. If you've been doing it for a while, absolutely. As a long-term strategy, certainly. But something to generate sales right off the bat is probably not going to help you. Right? So you can start to see that when we're looking at this, this is why I'm going to go back to sales. What's going to generate sales when you start? I mean, I can have the greatest website in the world. I can have the greatest Facebook and, and, and Twitter accounts. But if it's not in stores, and that's my strategy, then what, how's that going to help me? So we need to get our priorities straight when we look at um, strategy. And, by the way, let's just go back here for a minute. Some of the obvious ones, take a look at this, the, this toolbox here, if you like. Some of the obvious things here, that if I am 
starting a retail location, as for example, if, if some of you are, are starting um, a location-based business, a retail location, let's say a shoe store, then your number one marketing activity is going to be location. And if I'm doing a location in St. John's, then why is that location in St. John's ideal for a shoe store? What kind of traffic is going to come by, walk-by traffic? So that should be your number one marketing activity, right? Because we know for a fact that um, that that a lot of stores, a lot of retail locations close because of poor locations. I, I vote 70%. The same point, some of you may actually be doing a consulting business and you've got um, a lot of existing clientele or contacts. So that should be your number one. If you've already got an existing clientele, let's say you've got already 20 clients or 20 people who are influencers, that's your number one marketing activity. So you can see that depending on the business, the order that you're picking gets you much more focused. So what I want to do at this point before I move on, because we're going to go in the, in the second phase of this, from marketing strategy into marketing tactic. Okay, well, here's something else. Sandy says something. Is it better to have a placeholder accounts for social media platforms? Um, I see. So, so I'm going to read this. So Sandy says, is it better to have a placeholder account for the social media platforms that we're not active on in the beginning? I post a picture once a month on Instagram if it's not one of the top three marketing tactics or leave the other ones alone altogether. So here's, and Sandy's brought up a very good point. Uh, what you want to do is, this doesn't mean you're not going to have a Facebook page or, or let's say a, um, a Twitter account. What it does mean is that you're going to ensure that that's not where you put your energies. And if you think at this point that you know, you're know you not going to even open it yet, that's fine. If, on the other hand, you think maybe, I'll, like you said, post a picture once a month, that's fine. But you need to ask yourself, is it going to do more damage than good? Because you, we all know that if, um, using your example, Sandy, of let's say your, your main uh, uh, social media strategy is Facebook, and then you're going to have an Instagram account. Is it going to do more damage by posting a picture once a month on Instagram than if I, if I didn't have it at all? If the answer is yes to no, you're not going to have an Instagram open yet, right? So it's really about minimizing that damage in the beginning, right? So you may have these other accounts. It's just about seeing, because uh, we've all had the experience where we go to an, like a, a, a blog and then, you know, we go once and then after six months, boy, they still haven't posted anything. And all of a sudden you look kind of, well, maybe they're not that serious about their business. Does that answer your question, Sandy? Okay. So before I go on, does anyone have any questions about marketing strategy before I get into marketing tactics? We're, we're going to get into marketing tactics soon. But I, I want you to understand the concept about marketing strategy and the process of selecting your top three. Now, don't get me wrong, you may have five, that's okay. This is, you know, I'm not gonna nitpick about whether you pick three or four, but certainly not more than five. Does anyone have any comments or questions about this? Yes, so as I said to you, Dominique, uh, how to pick your top three? You go back and you do market research. So, so how do you pick your top three? Right here, who's your best customer? What are the best practices in the industry? Look at the companies that were there before you who've been around maybe a couple of years. What strategies have they used that worked? So that's how you pick your top three, right? And you'd be selective. Anyone else with any questions about this section? I'm hoping as you start listening to this that when you do this, it should take some weight off your shoulder. Because there's a tendency when we're starting our business, my God, I'm missing something. What am I missing? I, if I just, boy, if I just, there's another marketing technique. If I just did that, uh, I should do like a viral video. What if I do something on, on, on YouTube? You know, like there, there's so many things you can do as an entrepreneur. You need to be mindful about thinking you're missing something. Um, and don't get me wrong, you're going to discover that there'll be other things you can add to your toolbox. But in the beginning, it's important to stay focused. Does that answer your question, Dominique? Okay. So I'm going to move on to the next section, if I may. And maybe, maybe Scott, I just want you to chime in on there. Um, 
Any comments on your end? All great thus far. Okay. So now we're going to go into the second layer of this. So now here's the first layer. The second layer, this is now gets a bit more, even more detailed when we talk about concrete. You can see that the, the three um, marketing strategies, uh, the strategies I picked, um, are very uh, focused on getting sales. A marketing tactic is now to take each of these marketing activities that I described, right, and talking in detail the how. How is this going to be executed? What are my expected outcomes to achieve sales? It has to be quantified. One of the problems I have with so many marketing activities is they're not quantified, right? I'm going to do Facebook and Twitter and viral video, and I go, okay, so how much sales are you going to get from each one specifically? Oh, uh, I don't know. That's marketing, right? Like it's, it's all about spreading the message. No, that's a bad idea. So let me take you to something specific. So take a look at the questions I'm going to ask you for each marketing tactic or marketing activity. I'm use, I interchange the words. It means the same thing. What will you do? How often? How much will it cost? Or the time will you spend on it? What will be the interest in this? What's the expected sale? So let's take an example so you'll see how that looks like. Now, let's take the second um, supporting uh, uh, tactic that, that the uh, you know, Raspberry Jam was using, which was in-store dem demos. So this person would say, OK, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a four-hour in-store demo. So I'm at you know, Coleman's, and I'm going to do a four-star. Someone walks in the door, and they go in, into you, you know, a certain section of the store. I'm going to have my little booth set up and my jam to taste. How often am I going to do this? I'm going to say, I want to do this every two months for each store I'm in. So every store I'm in, I'm going to go out, whether I'm in, in, in St. John's or, or Cornerbrook, and I'm going to set up my little booth and my little samples, and I'm going to have people tasting it. And when they taste it, I'm going to say, oh, by the way, it's on that shelf over there. Then I'm going to say, how much, how much is it going to cost me? Right? Well, I need maybe samples and materials, and maybe I, I, I think it'll cost me 30 bucks. Then I'm going to say, well, if that's the case, how many people will sample my product? And I, may, I say, I, th I think I can get 10 people an hour to sample my uh, jam. Now, I don't know how true that is, but I do know that coming up with some kind of number is better than saying, I don't know. It depends. No kidding. Remember what you need to remind, uh, remind yourself as an entrepreneur. Your job is to make rational or as best as you can, estimates of what you think will happen. And not only that, but the great thing about this is you can have a goal. I want, I want 10 people tasting my jam every hour. End of story, right? That's what I want to do. And I bet you 10 to 1, you'll get them. And my experience is that if you set some goals, you're more likely to achieve them than when you go, I don't know. And then I'm going to say for each four samples, I'm going to get a sale. So I know that each person that samples is, well, yeah, this is kind of nice, but I'm not interested in jam. I just wanted to come over. But if I get, you know, 25% of the people, I can direct them and I'll get 10 new customers. So in the second tactic, as you can see now, I have a metrics. But if I do a demo, I plan to get 10 new customers. Now, I don't know if that's true, but I do know one thing. I can certainly measure against this when I start it. Remember what I said to you before, is that market research is always ongoing. So I do this, I keep track of it, I have a little ticky box when people are coming by and I go, yeah, I was on or I was off by a bit, right? And so we as entrepreneurs need to realize this is not an exact science, but we need to have some kind of uh, um, quantifiable way of measuring where we're going with this. So before I move forward, do we have any questions? Because this is an important concept to get. So for each, and by the way, you would do this just for, you know, three of these. You would do the same for um, uh, knocking on doors at, 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 uh, at grocery stores, the, 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 you know, the Coleman's and, and, and the other store that, that I had listed there. And you would say, you know, if I knock on X amount of stores, this is how many will buy, right? You say, you know, if I knock on the Coleman's and Belden's, um, I'll get three stores each month. So, questions from the peanut gallery at this point. Do you have any questions about tactics and the details of tactics? 
Does anyone have any questions? No, is an expected sale of total guess. So here's the interesting, so just as, you know, is an expected sale of total guess. No, it's not. An expected sale is, you know, you're, think about this. So is it reasonable what I just made here? Like I'm, I made these assumptions. So, I, you know, I'm going to go 40 samples and then, you know, for each four samples, I'll get a sale. Um, you can start testing this yourself. You can start going to seeing how other people do demos and what kind of results they get. You can actually talk to people who do demos. I say, I notice you're doing demos in these, this product. So on average, how many people come by your, or, and, and taste this? Oh, right. So is it a total guess? No. Is it, is it a, a, um, some kind of rational explanation of what you shoot for and estimation? Yes, right? So, you know, I guess what I'm getting at here is that when you have a discussion, let's say with myself, if you're working with me, then when you tell me, for example, that you're going to have 5,000 followers on Facebook in your second month, I'm going to look at you and say, I don't buy that for a minute. You're not going to have 5,000. So let's go back. Let's revisit this. What's realistic? The point of doing this is to, is to give you some realistic assessment of what's possible and what's way out in left field. You'll see in a minute why this is important because so many people, when they start their business, they have unrealistic sales forecasts. This is exactly what you just said, just because they're just guessing. Like there's no rationale whatsoever about the sales. This is one piece of the puzzle. You'll see in a minute when we start looking at this, how you can make this even more succinct and a bit more uh, realistic. And, and at, at, at the end of the day, um, you know, just, no, this is not an exact science at all. But it's more about being rational and reasonable in the, in the assumptions you make. The whole business plan is an assumption. Ah, good point. So Jill said, how many attempts, example, in-store demo, should you complete before deciding whether it's an effective marketing strategy? So here's the other thing that's really important, and I'm glad you asked that question, Jill. So typically, why so many marketing strategies don't work is because they use what I call the jumping around approach. Of course, they don't know who their best customer is, so they go, well, I'll try Facebook. Ah, I tried Facebook for a couple of weeks, didn't work. I'll use Twitter. Ah, no, that's not working. Let me try Instagram. I hear Instagram is very good. So what happens is they don't stay long enough to see how effective the strategy is, right? So your question is a really good one. So you, Jill, you have to stay long enough, and, and I use the magic number of three months. It doesn't have to be three months uh, for everything, but this is why when you choose a strategy, you have to stay long enough to reap the rewards. You're not going to know um, what your Facebook strategy is after two weeks. That's too short. Same with networking, or in this case, demos in, in stores. You probably need to do this for at least two months to start to see how effective this is. So, Jill, is there a magic number? No, but certainly less than a month is you're wasting your time and energy. And this is the second thing that's really important. In order for a marketing tactic to be effective, it has to be consistent over time. So I'd rather if you picked, let's say, um, direct mail, where let's say you're doing flyers on a, on a constant basis, right, or in their neighborhood. If you do it once, that is, you say, I'm going to send it to 10,000 homes, you're wasting your money. However, if you do it five times, within a 2,000 homes, then that's different. So it's better to do a small sampling constantly, consistently over time, rather than going very large. So typically what happens is, again, this is what we get, uh, you know, this is what I call the miracle marketing cure. Hey, you give me this money and I'm going to spend it on, on, on reaching 20,000 customers. Yeah, but you're wasting your money if you do it once. I'd rather you do it on 2,000 customers, potential customers, 10 times, because that's going to give you a better result. So a very good question, Jill. Um, there has to be enough of, the, and you can see here as because you know, um, Jess was asking me this question about you know, so what numbers do I come up with? Great. There's work to be done here. If I do an in-store demo to find these numbers, I have to work at this. I have to get out and look and ask and question and and really think about this. And of course, there's I have to come up with a booth. I have to spend some money on the booth. What amount of samples? How do I talk about this? Um, good. You're doing something right. Because I want you to go deep. That's what I mean by going deep. You know, someone asked me about, can I be concrete? Yeah, here's some concrete. Go deep in this, right? You know, there's something, there's an interesting book called uh, Great at Work, which is they tell you to do less but obsess more. So do less but, but obsess with the less things you do to really become a practitioner. You know, 
the goal here is, as an entrepreneur is to become a practitioner in some of these marketing tactics that you do. So if you're going to do, if you're going to use Instagram, then be the best Instagram you can possibly be, as opposed to you know knowing eight of these apps and then you're pretty crappy at all of them, because or you know, just know the surface of all of them, right? Okay, makes sense. I hope. All right. Now, um, the next thing I want to bring your attention to is because we're going to be, you're going to start to see how this segues into the last webinar, sales forecast. Now, as you start doing this, I'm going to be asking you, okay, now you have to tell me what your sales are every single month, for, in our particular case, for 24 months, two years. And if you put numbers at the top, if you put 1000 bucks or whatever, it is, I'm going to ask you how to come up with that number. And that's exactly what uh, Jess was saying. A lot of people just guess. They just put some numbers down. They go, well, you know, a thousand. So, thousand dollars. I'm gonna have. I'm gonna sell a hundred products. So that's you know, a hundred products at ten bucks. There we go. Ah, uh, no kidding. I can do math. Thank you very much. I'm not asking that. What you have to think about in sales forecast is you come up with a sales assumption. The best way to do this. I don't care what your product is. Your product could be a service-based business, a product-based business, a combination of the two. Use the word average sale. My average sale is blank. My average sale is X. Now, or you can use three different gradations. So you can say high-end, mid-range, or low-range. You can do that as well. But don't go past three different uh, um, sort of uh, categories because then it becomes too complicated. So if you've got like 16 products, then just do three different uh, categories or just one average one. If you're doing a service-based business, on average, this is what people will spend. You also have to talk about repeat business. So if someone buys your product, so if someone's buying my jam, I'm going to make an assumption that though if they like it, they're going to come back. And I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to get like 80% repeat business, right? This average sales process is important for those of you that have a long sales process. So if we use the example of um, knocking on doors to stores to sell my jam, you know, that process takes time. A store is not going to automatically buy my products and services. It takes time. So how long do I have to knock on the doors of Coleman's and Bellman's before they buy? And that, you know, sales process could be maybe six weeks. Right? And what are the peak seasons and slow seasons? We know certain seasons are, are better than others in depending on what industry you're in. Right? And the last piece is, you know, I'm gonna do I'm gonna go to a major conference or a major trade show and that'll drive sales up. So let's take a look what I mean by that. So in the sales forecast, you have to have a rationale how you came up with those numbers. And your marketing strategy is really a collection of individual marketing tactics with measurable metrics, some type of measurable metrics. So let's be very concrete here. So let's go and use our um, Raspberry Jam example. So let's just, for hypothetical uh, sake, say, you know, it's new for her. She's starting her business, and she knows in the beginning she's not going to get that much sales. She's going to knock on some doors. Her average sale. Um, is three dollars and fifty seven for per jar for the, as a wholesaler, right? Now she may sell this uh, as retail price differently. Like if you noticed here in in her in in the store here, she's she's recommending to sell it retail for five ninety five, but if she's a wholesaler, she's going to sell it for three fifty seven, right? And she says, you know, I believe on average that when someone buys a, a jam. They're going to come back every six weeks to get another one. That's an assumption. She's going to test this out. But it's not an unreasonable assumption, right? Coming back to your point there, right, Jess? So she says that in my – and let's say she starts her business in February. And she's going to take a month or two before she gets going and knock on doors. She makes an assumption that after being a month of, of knocking on doors and talking to Coleman's and Melbourne's, that she'll be in three stores. They'll order each three cases uh, – or sorry um, – uh, sorry, one case, a uh, 12, right, 12 of these. Now, I'm, I, I really lowballed this on purpose. You know, you can say it'll be higher. That doesn't really matter. Um, but it, what you're trying to do is you're trying to give me some rationale that says that, you know, that in her first month of business, her estimation is that she's going to sell um, 36 uh, 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 jars of, of raspberry jam, or, or, or in her case, three cases, right, one, one in each store just to get her started. And I'm, I'm lowballing this. This could be better. She also says that if she does um, demos, she'll get two new customers. So she plans on doing a demo in each of the stores. And Instagram, because she's going to post every day on Instagram or second day on Instagram, whatever she tells me, 
And she's going to say, every second day, I'm going to post on Instagram. I'm going to show a new recipe using this raspberry jam. Put on Instagram, and then I'll get seven followers or maybe 20 followers. And of those 20 followers, seven um, will buy. Whatever her assumptions are, we're going to have a chat. Is that reasonable? Maybe, maybe not. But I do know one thing, that if she doesn't have an action plan, nothing is reasonable. Everything is an estimate. Then. Everything is a pie in the sky. Part of doing this exercise, and this is the key here, is that when you wake up Monday morning and you get money to start your business, you have an action agenda. Let's face it, this person has their work cut out for her. And you notice one thing. It's not spending a lot of time working on her tagline or fancy schmancy website because that's not going to get her business necessarily. Don't get me wrong. She's going to have a website. She's going to have some of these things. Very important. But her sales are going to come from knocking on, on doors and going to Coleman's and Melbourne's and, and showing people to test her product so they can, she can start to, to get a reputation. That's where branding comes in, a reputation, feedback, and spread the word about her promise. Later on, in the second and third year, she'll get referrals. In the beginning, don't rely. Don't, please don't put this in your business plan. My business is all word of mouth. No kidding. Who doesn't want that? Uh, like there's no one on the planet Earth doesn't want a word of mouth as, as part of their business plan, right? We all want that when we're business owners. But that's a passive way of getting business. This is an active way of getting business. And that's what really what we're getting at here is how can you be active in getting business? Okay. I'm going to open this up for questions. Do we have any questions here from anybody? I'll jump in, Dominic. Yes. That's okay, Scott? Yeah. Just to get back to the sales, expect, sales forecast explanations and a question that maybe Jess had said, um, that's probably one of the most popular questions that we get here is that mm -hmm. aren't we just making this stuff up anyway? You know what I mean? And like just trying to really rationalize those assumptions and explanations just to at least, like what you said, to get something down, you know, and to try to then be able to go forward with that. Well, and here's the other thing that you have to understand. Most entrepreneurs, when they start, their biggest concern, unless you're doing a daycare center, certainly in, Canada, in Toronto where, you know, there's a lineup and that's not an issue. Most of your concerns are going to be getting sales and marketing, like getting clients, right? And yet most people will do a really uh, poor job on that. So if you start your business and you go, I don't know, I'm kind of guessing. Well, good luck then if, you, if, if that's what you want to rely on, on getting your business success, I'm kind of guessing. The chances are more likely that you're gonna, it's going to work against you. Whereas if, the point of doing this is to come up with an action plan. And an action plan that's going to make you visible in front of your customers. You see what happens is too many people, because they're guessing, they don't know, they fall back on the path of least resistance. Who likes to go out and sell? I don't. Who likes to go and network? We all like to sit back and work on a website and a tagline. Why? Because it's kind of easy and fun. In my experience, if you're doing stuff that's uncomfortable, that's getting in front of your customers, rolling up your sleeves, then you're doing something right. And so my experience and my uh, advice is to get into this uh, deeper, even if it's not exact, but you're getting closer to where you need to be. Right? I don't know if that answers the question Perfect. correctly, sure. right? It does, yeah, absolutely. Right. I think it's just intimidating for a lot of people just to try to figure out those things and they don't know where yeah. to start. And, and what I tell people is don't worry. Um, you're going uh, you're gonna to be far ahead of anybody I know if you make an attempt than if you just leave it, right? So even if you tell me, I'm not really sure, but my, 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 my estimation for demos and how many people will come will be X. All right, let's, let's work with that, right? Let's start with that. Correct. Does anyone have a question or, or a comment about any of this? Very important, and I want to tell you that, um, as you can see from what I've just outlined, and if you use our um, our, our uh, uh, business plan writer, we have that, but yeah, I still get I would say 75% of the time, I still get the, the original version of marketing plans that are really terrible. They're just like, just ah, all over the place, nothing. So this is not necessarily easy work. This is just necessary work, right? And Dominic, what I often see too, um, in chatting with a lot of funders, is a lot of times they'll look at somebody's projected sales and then they'll immediately go to their marketing client, and then they'll actually question their sales because they say, what you presented to me in your marketing plan 
that just doesn't look like you're going to generate that level of sales. Yeah, yeah. It's and, just a drop start, the ball in the marketing plan, right? Yes, and, and exactly. So, you know, you're going to start to see how this connects. So in your marketing plan, right, this, this piece of the puzzle, when we look at this, let's go back, right? This piece of the puzzle, like this strategy and tactics, when you start writing this and then we go into tactics and give me some details here, I need to see how that translates into your cash flow. You start to see everything connects and in your sales forecast, all of this connects. What happens many times is what people write in their marketing strategy and tactics is different than what they write in sales forecast and different what they write in their cash flow. So that's why it's important to start to see how this all connects and to stay focused. And one last thing I wanted to mention here before we sort of wrap up this is your marketing budget. People, uh, uh, any institution, including Futurepreneur, will give you money for marketing. Makes sense. But we need to know what that marketing's for, the budget's for. So the marketing budget can be broken down into two distinct areas. The first is the marketing tactic budget, which basically means that, you know, I need money, so we use this demo example for supplies, for demo supplies. I need money maybe for a booth, um, and that's a marketing support. So marketing tactics budget is anything that supports the tactics. That is, you know, things where I've chosen to, to you know, those, those three marketing tactics. Anything specifically related to that is marketing tactic budget. Marketing support, because marketing support is not necessarily going to give you business by itself. Like a website, if people don't come to it, it's not going to get you business. A logo design by itself is not going to get you business. Neither is a video, right? Nor a brochure. Business cards, they're not going to give you business by itself. You have to do something with it, which is the marketing tactic. And so this way, when you tell us and say, you know, uh, Scott and Dominic, my marketing support budget, which is, you know, booth and all of this is 3000 bucks. My marketing tactic budget is 2000 bucks. Therefore, I need $5,000 for marketing. I go back, yeah, that makes sense. In the context of what you're doing, absolute makes sense. So you can start to see now how doing it this way also helps you understand how much money you need for your marketing. Anyone else with questions before we wrap up? Dominic, I'm just noting a thing in the chat that looks like a couple of people can't hear you. Oh, that's strange. Uh, I, I've been able to hear you the whole time. So Jeff, Dominic, don't know if you guys can hear me and or Dom. You guys yeah, still I, with no audio? Yeah, I don't. I'm okay. That was at the beginning. They can hear me. Okay, so that's good. Okay. So does anyone have any uh, comments before we wrap up? Oh, okay. Sorry. No. How are we doing? Okay. Anyone? Yes. No. Is it is it making a bit more sense in terms of and remember uh, when you're looking at uh, this a marketing plan, uh, you have to understand uh, that so many business plans are not written like this. And, you know, unfortunate that a lot of people uh, are writing business plans that are really meant for high end companies. They're you know they're talking about market shares and all of this stuff, and I go, what in the world is that? That's not helpful. That's not practical for me as an entrepreneur. And so in my way of thinking, I want this business plan to be a practical tool that you can use and come back to. Um, so uh, Dominique, you're going to have to speak to, to Scott about uh, financial support for marketing. Uh, um, we don't do grants, but we do um, loans. And I think later on, uh, you'll see Scott has his contact, and you can certainly connect with Scott about understanding what uh, Futurepreneur does. So I wanted to move on to end the, the, the webinar. Um, Here's something interesting. I love this quote. Just take a look at it. It says, to build a long-term successful enterprise when you don't close a sale, open a relationship. Ultimately, and this is something we all need to realize as entrepreneurs, that selling is nothing but developing relationships, developing trust with people. So the good news is that all of us know what that feels like when you develop trust. All of us know what it means that when we're growing a business, uh, that if we can focus on the relationship we build, then that'll be less scary than saying, I want to make a sale, right? Because, you know, using that raspberry jam, and, you know, the great thing, and I, you know, this is a side note, like, you know, when I was in Newfoundland, I found people really friendly. 
people are pretty friendly and they'll engage with you. They'll talk to you. So if I'm doing this raspberry jam, they'll come and talk and they'll talk about what they like and what they don't like and I'll learn something. And, and all of a sudden, it's not as daunting um, to start this business and, and talk about sales as I, I initially thought, right? But it does mean having something specific that I can do every single day that can get me in front of potential customers, my best customers. Okay. So uh, next uh, on the, uh, the end of this is um, the next one will be next week, which will be the last one. It'll be on the cash flow. Don't you love that one? We're going to talk more about numbers. You're going to see how that numbers games really comes into place. Um, and uh, you can go on our website there um, to learn about um, taking the other webinars if you haven't taken them and where to register as well. And if you've got any questions, Scott's available there. I think he posted it in the chat box his email address if you've got any questions. Um, and also, um, you can go on our resource page to, to use our business plan writer, which I strongly encourage you to do. Our cash flow template, and by the way, because I'm going to be talking about cash flow next week, if you go on there in this resource page, there is a video of me yapping away on how to do a cash flow. It's a three-part yeah, I know it's not the most exciting thing to do, um, but if you wanted to get a head start and how to use a cash flow, uh, it's a great resource for you as well. So, Scott, do you have any final words before we sign off? I do. Yes. Thank you, Dominic. Another great session. So, again, and I have watched your three-part uh, web your series videos on cash flow. Very, very good. So, if anybody wants to have a look at those before the next session, definitely do it. They provide a lot of detail. Great for helping somebody develop a cash flow statement. Um, again, we have the next webinar uh, next Wednesday, as Dominic mentioned. Go to the website to register. Scroll to the top of the chat box. Uh, my name, my phone number. Again, I'm based here in St. John's, Newfoundland. So, if anybody in Newfoundland and Labrador is looking for information on the Future Pinor Canada program, please reach out to me, phone or email address right there. If you would like a copy of these slides from Dominic's session, please send me an email after this at my email address, and I will send you a copy of the slides. As I mentioned, in about probably less than 24 hours, we will have a copy of this presentation uploaded onto our YouTube channel. Uh, that you can watch it again at your time, at your convenience. I also have the first two posted there. And we actually now have the dates confirmed for when Dominic is coming down again in March. Uh, so I know some people, I know Sandy attended one of the ones, first ones there and some other people. So Dominic is going to come down and do a road show and bring his bring his great expertise on the road here in Newfoundland and Labrador. So it looks like he's going to be in Central, uh, Grand Falls, Windsor on Tuesday, March 13th, then he's going to be here in St. John's, Newfoundland, Wednesday, March the 14th, then he's going to be on the West Coast, West Coast in Corner Brook, Thursday, March the 15th. So if anybody would like to, and these, all of these sessions, we're going to be posting the link. We don't have the registration up yet, but they're all going to be posted, or sorry, all going to be hosted in colleges in North Atlantic, uh, and they're all from 9 in the morning until 12, and so you can have an in-depth three-hour in-person session with Dominic. Dominic is even better in person, and you get to ask him a lot of great questions too. So stay tuned for that. And hopefully, Dominic, maybe by next Wednesday at our webinar, we might have the link up. People can register for those, hey? Fantastic. So thank you all uh, for coming out and listening, and, and I hope to uh, have you on the webinar, the last webinar next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Okay. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.